this is uh, part of a series called Roommates. Roommate number one. Emma was a quiet, well-read young woman with no furniture and a wry sense of humor. For the first year, she kept to herself, slept late, drank coffee, and stayed in bed reading novels. She only left the apartment to go to work and to the grocery store. On weekends, she watched movies with her friend Matthew. When he moved to Manhattan, Emma frequented the shishi bars of Chelsea, house sat, and played with his Abyssinian cats. After two years, she moved to Manhattan. We parted amicably. She left her bed, a dresser, two night tables, and her collection of Roddy Doyle. <laughs> Roommate number two, Kim. Korean, age 23, graduated from Vassar with a full scholarship. Despite her youth, she talked her way into becoming my roommate. She worked late hours and went to school in the evenings. In April, she told me that her father, a sole businessman, would visit. He insisted he would stay with her. When he arrived, he realized I was not Korean. He moved into a hotel. Year two, she discovered Argentinian tango. Every Sunday, she put on her black stilettos and tangoed at the pavilion in Union Square. Six months later, she received a scholarship to law school in some godforsaken place in Texas. She left me and her tango partner to live in the Lone Star State. <laughs> Roommate number three. The day after Lily moved in, she burst into the kitchen to show me the diamond ring, necklace, and earrings that she purchased for $12,000 with her school loan money. <laughs> this woman in the store told her it was a good investment. The jewelry was not returnable. I hoped she could pay the rent. Skipping to roommate number six. <laughs> Callie. Callie returned to New York after a three-year stint in the Peace Corps. The curly-headed 24-year-old had become the assistant director of volunteers at Planned Parenthood and my new roommate. On Mondays, she attended NARAL meetings. Tuesdays, she baked bread for the Women's Prison Association. And Wednesdays, she organized a knitting circle in the living room. Callie and her do-gooder peers sat in a circle drank wine, and listened to Joni Mitchell. <laughs> they talked about politics, work, and their relationships with their mothers. The apartment became an international hostel. <laughs> Women from Algeria, Spain, Belgium, Libya, and a half dozen other countries stayed over for a week or a weekend. The night of the blackout 2003, I zigzagged from an office building on the east side across to the West Side Y to pick up my sneakers and ended up walking across the 59th Street Bridge with two women from Queens. Despite my foot injury and the unbearable heat, we made it to Queensboro Plaza, then parted. Having inherited the no sense of direction gene from my father, I had no idea where I was or where I was going. At an Italian ice cart, I met a young woman and followed her to Broadway and 31st Street. There, I was greeted by my noisy upstairs neighbors who redeemed themselves by escorting me home by candlelight. In total darkness, I entered the apartment, thirsty, exhausted, and dripping with sweat. There sat Callie and a friend at the kitchen table drinking wine and eating pizza. I scrambled to find candles and ranted and raved while reviving myself with water and food. They sat still like ice cubes while I proceeded to melt down. Callie's friend Joyce had a car and they drove home in daylight unscathed. Joyce, afraid to be alone in the dark, stayed overnight and slept in Callie's bed. She insisted they keep the door open and I listened to them sing kumbaya and camp songs the entire evening. A week later, I asked Callie.
to leave. Thank you. <laughs>